talking about the, um, the history, starting with 1954. Hey, so again, um, happy to uh, share my uh, thoughts. Um, you know, each one of us as an individual in life, the way we look at things, actually, it's almost always dictated by our experiences that um, involves the kind of training background and uh, who we meet both physically and in the books that we read. So that much as uh, one who has spent his life um, in uh, medicine and science, um, and that's one who has actually experienced, you know, social injustice himself. I have come to look at the world and look at problems from mostly like the first thing that I look at the human body. The first thing is that you diagnose the problem appropriately. And the second thing is that you look for treatment. And the third thing is that you look for prevention. Um, that said, when I go back to look at, I was not born at the time of um, the joining of the two Cameroons. So I really cannot speak too much about that. Even by the time of uh, reunification and stuff like that, I really cannot, I can only talk about what I read in the books, not what I know. But uh, when you just, back, just, just one moment, cousin, just one moment. Let us not use that word reunification. Because that word, that, that word reunification was just written in the history books and in books. Nobody yeah. living yeah. or dead can answer the question where was it? When was it? How was it? So that, yeah. that we should never use Absolutely. that again, that concept. No, Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, correcting me of that uh, slip of uh, that slip of the tongue. If you had seen my, my hands, I was talking as if I was actually being uh, followed on stage because my hands actually showed quotation marks. Yeah. Then let's go back to looking at what I've read. And what through my observation and through my analysis seems to, I mean, it's very, very true. In 1961, when uh, these two countries, they were thinking about, you know, the two countries coming together. Our people in the Southern Cameroons or British West Cameroons or currently Amazonia, as I would like to refer it from here on, on so forth, we're looking at thinking about a confederation. They were thinking about the spirit rather than the letter of what was actually put in place. So to them, they were thinking about a confederation. And that meant that they thought the 
power of the most things that was going to affect their lives lay within their own hands in Boya, in the local, in the local um, from Boya, spreading down into the local communities. And the very, very minimal power was actually to be uh, in the hands of the central government. But on the other hand, as deceptive as the, the brothers from uh, La Republique are, what they were thinking is they saw this as a first step towards annexation. And here actually lies the fundamental problem. You know, the original scene of this um, unholy um, marriage that was ever destined to fail. Now, if you think about that, the reason why that's, that, that explains why 1972 really came to be and explains why 1984, uh, was it 19, I think it was 1984 when they changed it, finally changed it to a lot of yes, things. That's right. why it came to be, you know, because, and the other problem that we've had in Africa over the years um, is that the presidents of Africa are but like real estate managers, especially Francophone Africans. The, re, the owner of the real estates in Francophone Africa sits in Paris. And then you have real estate managers who are actually occupying the presidencies of the Republic of, of the so, of the so-called republics that are these countries with flat independence. And in this case, what the French did was actually use their puppet at the time, I hear you, to actually, you know, and, 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 and have him have technocrats that could craft into some so-called legislation or so-called documents and found a path that was gonna deceive the people into believing that this particular ill-fated union was real. And that's where we find ourselves here. Because throughout the history of Africa, a lot of the problems that we've had, including Ambazonia problem, lies at the root of what? Social injustice. It lies at the root, I mean, what we did, it, it's um, the, I mean, the, the social injustice actually is at the root of this. And it's about controlling people. It's about you being able to dictate, you know, their future. And the, what Rousseau would call the, um, the Locke and um, Hobart, what they call the social contract. In our social contract, in every community, the social contract is to find a form of governance whereby it would be possible to have a, an equitable distribution of the resources of the people within and how people can live under a framework of law and order. But here we're not talking about the law of the jungle. We're not talking about, you know, the order of tyranny. You know, but in a system where somebody is trying to do something where the, the that you have a perverse social contract, which is actually just meant to be a smokescreen for tyranny, for people to actually um, control others. Then this is where our problems are, that it actually correctly begin. And so if you then see what then, this explains how these two problems have come to be. So I was growing up, my primary school, secondary school, until I left Cameroon in 1991 after high school, you know, it, it, you, you, I could, you could see some of the relics of 19, of the, of, the, of the good culture that our people had, you know, when they were still, um, you know, at the stage where um, Axel had um, the top term, the undiluted, the undi when they still had their undiluted values. And I walk you through a few that I observed as a son of the palace who has lived in palaces, I observe that in the palaces, most palaces, at least in, my, in, my, in my, my area where I come from, had no doors. Most palaces were like the, um, these were the social service centers. If you had more, you went and gave to the palace. Those who didn't have went to the palace and took. These are things that we took. The customary court system that I watch with my 
you know, uh, when my when my when my eyes as a as a as a, as a child in those Hassian days was a place where you did not need one did not need a lawyer. All you need were witnesses, and the only thing that was actually um, at stake there was the quest for justice. It was not about your influence in society. It was not about money. So in other words, corruption was alien. When we got up to see the police officer, I think my very first image of the books that I read about the police officers in Western Cameroon were these guys in shots who um, were very, very, you know, um, these people who, who if, if, if there was ever anything like corruption in your gene, it needed to have been into your DNA. It had to be expunged before you became police officers because these people were incorruptible. The other thing that I saw at that point was something that we call the sanitary officer. And that sanitary officer, these, was the, um, pe these were the people who were responsible for maintaining for making sure for ensuring hygiene remember as a physician as i can say if you go back to most of africa uh, where most of the diseases are communicable diseases it tells you that if you actually eliminated you know or, or maybe uh, eliminated on hygienic conditions what is going to happen is that you're going to limit you know the spread of most of the diseases and in a, so these the sanitary officers had a responsibility the look at where the toilets were, the look at where the water, uh, the sources of drinking water were, the look at how clean your compound and all these other things were, which were like the beginning, the building blocks of public health. And again, these people could not be corrupted. Nobody took money. They issued you a ticket if you had, if you violated one of those uh, particular, uh, um, you know, Rules of rules or agreed laid down principles. If you are violated, if you violated it, they issued you a certificate and then you went to court or you went to wherever you were supposed to go and pay. So and you will be judged before being paid before paying for, for this. All of a sudden, violates, you know, sometimes we then started hearing things like Kale Kale. You realize that Kale Kale doesn't have a word in, uh, it's not, it, um, it's not, I mean, it doesn't have translate. Nobody in, in Cameroon called, I mean, uh, in Amazonia has an English word for it because it doesn't exist. That was not something. And this is when you had this brutal, these brutes who were dressed, who were often called, who were called the military or gendarme officers or whatever. They would just actually come to into a community and round up people as some form of a collective punishment for crimes that could range from crimes of thoughts to crimes of commitment to crimes of imagination. So you just had to think that you were imagining something in, and, and you got punished for that. And then if you think about it, then you started seeing where, as I was growing older, the place became more and more corrupt whereby initially, in early on, you'll find that a police officer, even if they had to take bribe, there will be all these attempt to hide the bribe, attempt the fact that somebody, but then all of a sudden, right now, actually you then see that the police officer take bribe and actually give people change on the road. And so, so you, you got to think about it and then look at all of this and see and say, ask yourself, where did we go wrong? And the answer of where we went wrong is we left from a community that had a social contract that was actually designed to reflect the aspiration and the interests of the general masses to a system that has no social contract and where, again, force or repression becomes the only philosophy. And I will have to quote from, and that, that explains why you are seeing all some of this ever increasing brutality. Because many of these people might have read Nico Machiavelli, 
And one of his biggest quotes is that men ought either to be well treated or crushed. Because those that are not well treated, if those with light injuries can avenge their injuries, but those with more serious injuries cannot avenge. You know, so what that tells you is La Republic has now come, we're now in this alien community, uh, society where the idea is I either crushed you or you subjugate. So you have only two things. You have to become a slave or you are crushed. So I think that to me, as I look at this and I look back and I say, what, where did we go wrong? So haven't made this, and, um, um, you know, analogy, I mean, walk through this and look, make, look at the diagnosis and how it is impacting us. So how was the treatment? The treatment is, to me, when they started this fight, when they started this struggle, and I always said this, I am one who is not fighting for independence. And I'm not fighting for a federation. I'm just made, barely fighting for freedom. But it became clear to me that the only way to get freedom is independence. Just like it becomes clear to me at some point that the only way to get, you know, to save my patients sometimes is to amputate them or is to get part of their body out. So I think we need to think very, very um, carefully. And everybody who walks through and look at where we have been and look at what is happening, should be happening, really just realizes that there is no other way but independence. But independence itself is not our end. It is a means to an end. And that end for us is freedom. I want to go back to those Hassan days where I could leave my house, I could get to Ambazonia, and then leave my house open, go to where I want to go, meet the policeman on the road, and actually think about the policeman as a friend rather than a foe. I want to go to an Ambazonia where if I had an issue and I went to court, it would not be driven by how much I can pay or who I know, but rather by what the merits of my case are. I want to go to an Ambazonia where our children are going to read and study, not to become literate idiots, but educated people who are able to actually use their education to improve on their lives. I want to go to an Ambazonia where people have a future, people can dream again. And our dreams, the dreams of the children should not really be limited to so should not all, the children should not only see their dreams across the ocean, but they should be right there in Amazonia. We are too rich a people to be able to do this. So I think that that's the Amazonia I'm fighting for, where I could disagree with somebody, but I would defend their rights for being able to say whatever thing they need to say. And so in an Amazonia where it's an ideal. It doesn't really matter where you come from, from the world, general, I mean, as long as you're willing to live within the law and work for prosperity and work for the interests of that country. So that's all I want. That's all I want. And that's what I'm fighting for. And that's the Amazonia I really want to see, which, is, which would be very similar to my romantic view of Amazonia as a little kid, seeing what I used to see and imagining what it could only have been, which the, the, the older people in this forum were telling us and probably would tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, cousin. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, cousin. You make me very, very nostalgic uh, uh, with your tale of uh, the veterinary inspector. I remember in, in the local markets, they were going there testing and checking that uh, before they slaughter the pig, they had to be of good um, uh, uh, a breed. Again, we are writing our history. When you write your history, you say it the way you want, the way it happened, and uh, all those other hidden things, you put it point blank. Tangye has been listening patiently 
maybe you should approach uh, look at it from the education side and uh, what other uh, what else you can add to to uh, what has been uh, a, such a, a wonderful uh, day for our history thank you so much for our previous speakers for that elaborate uh, x-ray of who we are as a people uh, before I get down to it, I just want to add that um, growing up, one thing I knew about uh, West Cameroon is from the point of a kid observing my father who was forced into the system. Now, my father is a cousin to Ande Tumaza, and as a kid, I could see all the intimidation going on in our house. <laughs> Actually, um, Chang Fo's father and my dad were contemporaries, and they were all teachers. So uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they're all teachers. And uh, just to talk about the freedom, when Tumaza left the country, knowing that my father was uh, the cousin or the related. Our house was under constant search. As a kid, I could not understand. He said, while he was wherever he was in Russia, uh, they were sending, he was sending communications to my father to mm -hmm. distribute to all other UPC members in Cameroon. In fact, my father moved on to join the CP, uh, CNU and all of that. Now, something which comes on, which I want to underline what's been happening with the French is, can we capture all the theory of hegemony, where they want to take care of all your systems and make you to control everything, you know? Uh, an example of this is in, your, in our educational system. I'll get into that in a minute. But before we get into that, they have this culture of elites where you have a few people, you know, they call them culture of elites, I call them, you know, the, for lack of a proper, uh, proper description, they're like, uh, the, 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 like house slaves, where people, Anglophones who are in Yaoundé and who are seeking for, they're fighting over each other, seeking for appointments and nominations and all that, claim the title of elites and claim to speak on behalf of the people without the mandate of the people anyway. And so these elites walk through the system of praise singing, motion of support. They do all of that motion of support and they think it comes from the people. You know, there is no real democracy. I knew that people were voting in, 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 in West Cameroon. And that example of free and fair elections was seen in our educational system. Educational system, right from primary school, you elect who your head boy was. In secondary school, you elect your senior prefect. In Kasbambili, it was uh, electing the student official, student government. So students, students were, young people were involved at all levels, you know. But now when it comes to education, you know, you can say this, mm -hmm. the type of education you allow the people, education empowers the people on how you influence education, you know, influences every other aspect, including political. All right, I come from that bilingual generation. Uh, my dad, being a politician at that time, and seeing the system said, for you people to survive in this country, you need to learn French and English. Now, learning French gives you an advantage. And so, while my brothers went to Sacred Heart, those of us, the younger ones, my dad said, you need to go to a bilingual school. And I happened to have gone through bilingual yeah. grammar school. I'm working on a paper right now about education. But what they did was in the early days, they had, it, uh, they had uh, the bilingual grammar school that started in Manowobe. And they also had components of that school in Yaoundé. 
But the bilingual grammar school, Mono Obe, which moved to, uh, to Boya, was the model that they wanted to. And they got a, young, a group of young people. Now, for the Anglophone section, you're getting the creme de la creme. All those who passed in list A exclusively, they went to bilingual grammar school, Boya. And then those who passed the French exams also got there. In Form 1, you would have intensive French for Anglophones and intensive English for Francophones. You did that for Form 1 and Form 2 for the two years. And in the third year, they all got together and they did intensive French and intensive English. But the caveat is they were preparing us for the French ordinary levels, the APC. And so the emphasis was more on the French system. And so we could not do much of, uh, say, liberal arts stuff that other schools were doing. So if you're doing, if you are, if, you know, in other schools, if you're going towards the sciences, you would have to cut away things like literature, economics, and all that, limit yourself to the sciences and all that. However, in the second year, in the fourth year, everybody wrote the Bay PC, Anglophones and Francophones. And, you know, actually after the fourth year, because when children are young, from 11, 12, their brains are like sponge. They soak it really well. And you could not tell who was an Anglophone or who was a Francophone. That bilingualism was get, taking roots there. And so we all did that, but yeah, we were, the, the pride, of course, Aijo, at that time, Aijo was still president. And, you know, we, <laughs> Our uniform in Lycée was the blue government school uniform, sky blue over navy, uh, navy blue over sky, uh, navy blue over sky blue. And then the other uniform was the YCNU material. We did not have, so we're like party Star Wars. We're youths of the party, whether you liked it or not. Everybody was co-opted into that. All right, fast forward. We finished there. All the Anglophones we finished. And then, of course, the success rate was pretty high for my batch in particular, and then we went to Form 5. That is why in Lycée we had to do all our syllables in, say, more than half in Form 5. The caveat is this. Anglophones moved to Form 5 to do the GCE. Francophones moved to, uh, they moved to Segon. There was no mandate for them to do the GCE as much as the mandate for us to do the uh, Bay PC. Think about it. We all, the idea was get to teach as many Anglophones as possible French. Don't bother if the Francophones learn English. It doesn't really matter. That's why I posed the question there for uh, admin. I talk about the, if I can get a document about the enforced, you know, English, in, enforced French. More French classes, more French stuff by radio for the Anglophones. Look back now, looking back in our time in Boya, there was the Alliance, Fran uh, Alliance Francaise, now they call it Alliance franco camonais It was the French Cultural Center. Yeah. That was the main place that had, that was the main library. There was no, no, no English-speaking public library. That was the central focal point for all the students in Boya. Maybe Sasse or Bishop Rogan had their own small library. But for a public library, that was it. That had all the events in Boya, cultural and all the like. Now back to this educational point. Moving up to university, uh, like I said, all Anglophones were forced to do the Bay Pace City Francophones, you know, forced to do the GCE. So it was more the process of assimilating us. Go to the university. Fast forward to university. How what was the system in the University of Yaoundé? That lone university. How many Anglophones could survive outside the uh, outside the faculty of, uh, faculty of arts, outside English, that was in English. Yeah. Geography, yeah. history, every other thing was in French. Of course, very few people went, went through the sciences. Very few. Extremely smart people could not survive in the faculty of science. Now, an interesting point, which, you know, I was having this conversation with my classmates in that the same thing, and I said, so how long did the bilingual thing continue? And 
For those who remember, there was Ipa Boya. Ipa was the educational component there. And uh, yeah. in 84, by the time that interest, my friend wrote that interest in, uh, interest in integration had waned. And so the bilingual class thing was no more functioning. Now, she was just being polite because she's a professor in Cameroon, she wasn't polite. But the truth is, after 84, when they had achieved their aim of complete assimilation on the, on the educational skill, the issue of bilingual, uh, bilingual classes was, never, was, was, not any, was, not, was not a big deal anymore because you have formed those of us that we call the post-independent generation. And all the youth growing up in the country where now to survive in any higher institution, you needed to learn French, whether I like it or not. And it was taking roots. So you had come full circle and therefore that issue of bilingualism wasn't there. Bilingualism literally means not learning English and French. Bilingualism in their terms, following the theory of hegemony meant Anglophones had to learn French. It wasn't the reverse. Now, don't get me wrong about the merits of bilingualism because if you look at the early, currently in leadership in the country, Agbotabi, Popo, uh, Aya, Elokobi, um, right. Prime those Minister, those are all, uh, Agbotabi, those are all products of the bilingual grammar school from Manowobe. Look yes. at the school of translation in Cameroon. Uh, those who went to the school of translation, the bulk of them are from bilingual grammar school. Those are uh, anglophones in the translation business. There they are. Mm -hmm. And where are they? All of them are abroad, international organizations, OAU, UNO, and all that. So those are the yes. positive that came up there. As a product of that, yeah, bilingualism has helped me in my career. You know, graduated from school, and I taught I, at the University of Ngaoundere. That's a French-speaking university. I was teaching in French because I got the ability. But yes. historically, that was their aim. And if you're able to capture people, capture captures people, people's education, because that is the easiest way to get to them. And everybody's going down. My father retired and he never went down to Yaoundé to collect his uh, whatever, to fight for pension as everybody does. He said, I don't want to go die in that steps and go and some stupid secretary would talk to me about stuff. I worked hard for my country, and if they don't pay it, I had to do his, I had to do, work out his retirement benefits, which he got, I think, about more than 10 years after I retired. Because my classmates had gone to a and I'm like, this is my father's document. I don't have so right now. I'm, I'm still working on mine. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, you see, it was, it, is all, it was all deliberate. It was all deliberate, and it has come full circle exactly. because everybody's realizing it. Everybody's realizing it. So using education as a key to do whatever they were doing, and when they had achieved their aim, because it, it, it was when I realized that after 1984, there was no more enforcing the bilingual thing. Look at the bilingual schools in Yaoundé and all over the country. They, are, they say bilingual school, no. There are two parallel systems. Whereas initially, it wasn't a parallel system. It was really, I'll call it an immersion, the immersion, immersion system of education that they had. But they did that in Boya as a, 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 a I call it what, a, a test squad. And it worked pretty well. Akere Muna is a product of this. So look at yes. the leadership in Cameroon, all of that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm told, I think this guy, to, uh, what's his name, the former uh, Young Philemon. Yes. Watch them. They're all products of that from Yaoundé and yes. Boya. So that's what they did. So that is what I think about it um, in terms of what they did, you know. But looking at the glory days, because my father, in, <laughs> in his way and moment, said, listen, don't trust these people at all. He, after 1990, he retired, he said, we're, we're doing this thing not because you had to do it, you know. He said, my brother-in-law, they said, 
this is where we are. We found ourselves in this situation. We need to just dance along and make the best that we can. You know, that's what they were doing. But he couldn't take it no more. And he said, I mean, I'm retired. I don't need to be fighting this. You know, he had, I mean, he, he died with all the regrets. And he said, you people, it is your generation. That is why he, he you know, <laughs> with all my brothers, he said, it is your generation. If you people sit and you don't fight it, it is up to you. And that is why we've always been writing, advocating, and being activists in this stuff. Because he said, you can fix it. As for me, I'm dead and I'm gone. I'm old and, and fading out. But this is your country. You people fix it. You learn French. You learn French, and that was the reason why you learned French. You know? So, yeah, it was Thank all you. planned out. And, uh, you know, we can now see the reality because if there's anything, history does not lie. Your history is there. And looking at it from an educational standpoint, we would see the gradual process that comes to, that uh, 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 matches. There's, which is what the, the, the political agenda was. So they use education to achieve the political agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. And I see a cousin's mm -hmm. hand uh, is yeah. up. And uh, you know what? Uh, going to admin's biblical reference, we are uh, scattered all over the world like the stars. Even just from this panel, we we cover all the continents of uh, uh, of the of the world, so that you see that they drive most of us uh, uh, out of our land, and uh, to go and actually acquire knowledge, unite, and uh, Ambazonia has reason to never fall again. When we will be going back singing like uh, biblical uh, others uh, went back. I didn't even know that Tange and I actually shared that uh, piece of history of being from, uh, of having passed through the same alma mater in, uh, in uh, Mutko. Um, oh! But, <laughs> yeah. This, That's but interesting. This is, uh, yes, I, but this is uh, my point. A broken clock is twice, is correct twice today. Um, so, yes, we might have derived some benefit, you know, from just being quote-unquote bilingual. But you know, as you rightly concluded, that that was not really the goal. So it is just, a, it is similar to what, like when we, you read about slavery, you realize that the, for, the, for, the, for the home slaves, for the house slaves to actually work in the house, they needed to understand the master. They needed to understand the instructions of the master. And that's the point where they were teaching us the French. The French was not for us to actually like be able to, to, to help us. It was for us to obey the instructions and somehow almost again like similar to the house slave who somehow just because they are living in the mansion of the master would somehow make the mistake of thinking that that mansion is their mansion which right. is actually what is happening to our people you know exactly. somehow they teach you the french and then you are like you you are treating like this um, an idiot in, in, in how they are doing uh at least moron um uh, called atanganji when, when he's talking you know they somehow feel like they think that they are actually part of the system, not knowing that they are pawns, you know, in, on, the chess, on, the, on the political chessboard. Where is Noni Ephraim today, right? So, but I think that when Noni was actually operating there, he thought, oh yeah, this is us, this is us, this is we making the mistake to associate we. And the other thing I wanted to actually mention is this. Um, I actually... Uh, prepared to sit for the priest entrance, which eventually I was up to today. Nobody can tell me why they refused me from sitting the entrance, but it ended up being a good thing that I went to Nigeria and then did what I did and came back out here. But when I was reading, when I was sitting for that entrance, you realize one thing, that they had these questions that none of them made sense, especially in the sciences, because some idiot <laughs> just translated um, word verbatim, the question from English to French. So French. Yeah. I mean, from, from French to English, because all the questions were said in French and then translated yeah. to English. So when you read the questions in, in, um, in, in English, they made no sense. And then you pick up the English, the French section, the French version of it and read it, then you understood that these questions were quite simple. But they had complicated the whole thing because 
the in 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 their thought process the and the the, the their, their so called anglophones did not exist right they they were just you know they so the questions were set in the master's language and whatever you could get you know whoever could be brought there to actually translate it who really cares for these people anyway and i think if you are looking at the and then, and then you, you also mentioned you I think that in the education system you also felt uh, or maybe you might have um, missed the point that the French language was a compulsory paper subject in yeah. in, in a, at the GCEO level so you had to pass it right so but it was not the same thing in the French in the francophone and um, in the francophone system the English English was an afterthought you, you just didn't even require it you didn't need it. So you could do it if you wanted. Well, why did you have to learn the language of the slave? Instead, most people started learning English when they realized that all of a sudden, the English schools in Yaoundé and all the other major cities became of a flooded, of a run by our brothers from the from La Republique. When they understood that um, the that English is the international language of education and science. And that whenever they left that their cake system and came out, they actually realized that it, it, it was actually to their greatest advantage to learn English. And this is why our schools actually got overrun by, the, by, 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 by them. But again, sometimes when you give a golden ring to a pig, they don't know what it means. Because had they just known this, and they could have allowed us to keep the, the quality of our education system. So that even their kids, knowing that their kids too will benefit. But what did they do? They diluted, the, what they attempted to dilute the whole thing because they didn't understand what it meant, meant, it meant to, 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 I mean, to start up with. So these are some of the things I just wanted to also to highlight on the um, education, education front. You know, and you really realize that the, 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 our education system currently, uh, the universities have become glorified secondary schools, right? You left... As a science student, I spent um, one semester waiting, one, one semester that I was waiting to go to Nigeria. I was actually spending um, at, uh, at a zoo in Yaoundé that was erroneously called a university, you know, where you will go there and then realize that the things that they were teaching them in first year, and I'm not even kidding, in first year in yeah, university. Yeah, we, have, we did that in high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, from four and from five. Yeah. And some of them, in, the only thing that you could actually like say, yeah, these guys actually were a little advanced in us was mathematics. I mean, when it was, but that was for people who did not do advanced mathematics like some of us did in high school, what we call further maths. You know, so the system was so, so rough. High on, you know, some theory, some fictional thing that has no relevance in anybody as a life. You kind of work back and look at our own, you, if you look at the, 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 all, talk about all the scientists from that place, from, uh, from our own section of the country, who are at international places. Think about everybody. That person okay. actually either studied outside, or many of them who actually went through Yaoundé, actually either spent seven years traveling Cousin? The program that takes a, um, a first day, that was done in three years. Many of them did it for seven years. All got frustrated and, and went elsewhere. left mm -hmm. and yeah. went yeah. elsewhere. And then all of a sudden, the people that, you know, they had, had, had actually like the, 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 like the, 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 the proverb, um, uh, you know, stone that the builder rejected became the cornerstone. But could we give maybe Pam and uh, Uncle have some, they have been listing all the while. Maybe they may have a question. If... I have a question. Right, when the French were setting up French Cameroon, did they appoint the government of French Cameroon or did they take from the population? You know what I mean? Did they, did they set up like a free, or was it just you know they they appointed people that they knew would be compatible to them? Yes, they appointed people that would be loyal to them. Simple as that. 
Mm -hmm. Pam, I will, yes. I'll give you, I'll give, let me give you an answer in a sentence. One of the French, this is what the French said, that the, the Francophones, I mean, the, the Africans could vote, but they decided who they voted for, right? If you go back and look at their story, the, the governments that they put in Africa, they didn't call them presidents. Those were French governors. That is right. governors. Yeah, so, so, no. so, 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 the, so the idea of uh, the, the local people, I'm not, not talking about French governors being uh, French, I mean, like the white French, but I'm talking about using these uh, puppets as governors puppets. of these right. uh, places. So that, that alone should tell you what you need to know about that. <clears throat> That you that decide yes. who you did, did, did. It was kind yeah. of a it was kind of a rhetorical question, but I needed to ask it. Um, yes. yeah. um Auntie, mm -hmm. Shangfo, start, Shangfo started by talking of the elite theory. Yes. Um, you must understand too that even in France, France is a top-down society. Right. right. People in France People in France who rule all graduate from a school called Ena de Paris. Yes. So they have that kind of a system in which they handpick their own elite. This is how Chang Fo started. Right. So they have this elite theory, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you. Uncle, do you have anything anything to say? I don't I don't have any questions. I, I just simply would like to add from my perspective, from my lens, how interesting it is um, that uh, uh, the human condition, particularly as it pertains to uh, exploitation of people, is, is pretty consistent. There's nothing new. Right. What happens is they, they morph whatever generational growth that happens in some way in order to continue the crime. That's what, that's, that's what I happens. And I, th I think that with um, uh, Southern Cameroon, we, we all know about the, the, uh, the way in which they uh, disbanded certain energy resources and diverted them to uh, the French as well as the, the trade center and Etc. So, it's a long history, and they—they—it's nothing new. They learned that from way, way back. So, go ahead, Abako. Okay, I think um, uh, we have a little bit about uh, because we started late. A little bit about uh, uh, under ten minutes to go. Uh, admin, I see your hand up. After that, you see when the French realized the high moral of education that our people had. They had not to devise a, a means to destroy that. And in our days, we had what was known as civic, a subject called civic, where people, uh, the, uh, the children or the students were actually taught on, <clears throat> on uh, the values of uh, morals, ethics. So when the French discovered that, they had not to ask that that subject be banned. And it was actually banned and removed from our educational system. And today we see the level of immorality that we find in our society. Over to you, Nchangfo. Now, fine. I think I will have to congratulate uh, Dangi Admin for this wonderful uh, historical analysis. And I think... Uh, <coughs> We need to make sure this history, we continue to, 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 to preach it, to get to as many people as possible, to as many Abandonians as possible. Because it's an education that is very, very important. People need to be informed. While we have some notions, that education is, uh, you cannot uh, compromise that education. What I also want to note here is that, uh, what we retain is that, Indeed, it has been nothing but annexation. We, we've been annexed. And uh, another thing that uh, doesn't come, up, come out very frequently is that the, the, our Francophone brothers, delegated from France, have been just rendered useless. And France, in fact, had even worse instructions 
for them to deal with us brutally as we are seeing it right now. There is this hatred, I must tell you, having watched here in, in, this, in the ground here for almost 40 years, there's a lot of hatred directed at the Anglophone. In fact, if the Anglophone did not exist, it would be very good for them. Uh, and we are going to expand upon this. I'll expand upon this uh, in the future when, 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 when we come back. Uh, and I will tell you much about that from, from ground zero. So it's a lot of hatred. So they don't even want you. So you can see examples. Whether you are a prime minister, you know, he thought he was, uh, and only was a good friend. When we all came back from America, we had our small groups we were meeting. But the moment they made him a uh, minister, he didn't want to talk to any of us. And they used that principle all the time to divide and rule. So divide and rule is another thing. But I think the most comforting thing that all of us should return tonight is that, and I want to make sure, I want to mention this, is that in spite of all this, the Anglophone or the, let me, let me use that word, this Cameroonian has been saved by his family. Family. Family first. What we are all started from our families. That has not changed. That is a good thing about it. So in general, all the morals, all the good behavior, uh, and whatever we call responsible citizens tomorrow, started and still remains in our families. So we do some analysis here that our, pro our French brothers are just wasting their time. There is no, there is hardly any British Cameroon family that doesn't have enough educated people, either here, resident here or abroad. And that are actually the ones that are keeping their families alive. That is a good thing. Now, whether it's also political opinion, the family has also developed its own politics and it has also made us political savvy. There is nothing they can do to us. And it's becoming very, very evident that all of us, whether you are working in Yaoundé, Bameda, whatever, in the Dwala anyway, as an English person, that family spirit of yours remains. And you fundamentally don't like the way the French do things. Not the French person per se, not the Francophone per se, but the way they do things and how they have been rendered useless. We're all very conscious of that. And I think that's a plus for us. So, and I'll end up by giving us some questions, which I, I don't think they've ever been discussed. Just this, and then go home and then come back with answers. Can you cite for me some 10 very good advantages that actually drove us to uh, to decide to get into this union or whatever to, to this uh, to this uh, association with uh, uh, Francophone brothers in that 1960 whatever it is. Can, uh, are they, can can somebody come up? Can, can somebody tell us what those advantages were? How attractive were those advantages that made us even to, even to be thinking about even associating with them? What went wrong around 1972? Oh, let me say, let me let's say, let me let me start from uh, say even '67 when political parties were banned, or even earlier. I think at the same time when Joa uh, was taken off as prime minister, uh, where our democracy was now they started to dismantle our democracy. What happened? Were these advantages or were these advantages still very strong in such a way that we could not react? Uh, what happened in 1972? We all know. What happened in 1982? I hear you right. What happened in 1984? We all know that. Why is it that we have never really actually spelled out, even to our children of tomorrow? Why is it that we are still very uh, docile, very complacent? And uh, I would say another fear is a very key factor. They can fear alone make people not to put up their own voice and to tell people and to tell the world why they don't like this they don't like that the anglophone general has been has been bullied to the point of um, i mean to the point where at least he's become perhaps nonchalant and i won't say nonchalant i would say maybe a little bit indifference which is dangerous so let's examine what is it that really what points were put up to really make us join these people and what went wrong? Are those points still tenable as well, or are they all destroyed? Do we need to put up now new strong arguments as to why we should leave? We know them, but let's think about that. So that's why I will end there. We'll develop it later on. Okay, Axel, over to you. Um, 
I want to thank all the speakers. It's been really, really enlightening. Uh, uh, I have very little to say. I just make two comments. Maybe I begin from the very last one uh, from Changfo. I actually have um, an article on the one of the questions Changfo posed, and it is the British Southern Cameroon British Southern Cameroons conflict in the shadows. In that article, uh, uh, I think it is published in the Commonwealth Journal for International Affairs. I do not know quite well, but if you put in my name and put conf uh, Southern Cameroon's conflict in the shadows, you can read some, some of my research in that area. Mm. Uh, and the second one is, um, I think it was still you, Chang, for who had mentioned uh, reunification or federation. Um, today we hear a lot from this Kamto guy. In 2000, in West Echo, Kamto actually said, the whole idea of federation was a stepping stone. It was a smoke screen. Uh, and that Ahidio had just used it to achieve his ends. And by the way, he concluded, by the way, la federation pour quoi faire. So all through their lives, they, ne they never meant it. They have never meant it. And uh, I think Ayang Wei has a very big book on the betrayal of two trusting a people. Anybody who has a copy of that book, it's the, be, uh, the betrayal of two trusting a people. I just wanted to bring this research in uh, to add to all the great insights that everybody brought to the table today. Thank you. Well, um, well, I think we've had a wonderful uh, discussion from our discussion. Uh, I can only summarize that uh, we have exhumed the buried and neglected history that sustained the Ahijo Bia regime to usurp and try to neutralize and dissolve uh, the uh, British Southern Cameroon. So from uh, listening to everyone, and our, I hope that our listeners and viewers have learned something and that uh, we are masters of our own history. Uh, we are writing our history. We are not perfect, but we are giving uh, the other side of the coin for you to just oppose and see and compare with what uh, uh, already are in the books and what we were, we and the world uh, uh, was made to understand about us. Who we are is what, uh, is what we are telling the whole world now through our experience. And also knowing that if we were really a wicked, uh, warring people, we would not have left Nigeria peacefully. That in itself is characteristic of any other country in the world and in Africa. And also to come and settle on this blessed land that uh, we call uh, uh, today the Republic of Amazonia, granting refugee status to uh, French Cameroon, who are now becoming uh, become our uh, murderers. So I really thank everyone. And we know that we believe in God. Our struggle is a God-ordained struggle. It will happen when he wants it to happen, and it will inevitably happen. So on that note, I pass it over to Uncle. If you have anything to say to wrap it up. Well, I, I, I guess the, I would simply like to ask if uh, anybody had anything important. I would just like to share that um, I, uh, I lost a brother. We all lost a brother. Um, I will not mention any names um, in, um, in, a, in the homeland um, at a divisional hospital this week. It was quite a shock. And I, 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 I'd like um, 
30 seconds of, of silence for, for himself and all those uh, who have been um, impacted on the ground this week in a terrible way. So 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. And um, with that, the meeting is adjourned and we'll see you all next week. Oh